On the topic of breakups, um, what should we do directly after a breakup? Maybe the week after or the days after. Um, I, the reason I ask this is because that's the time where you're not really thinking logically and it's just all emotions. And so what should we do directly after a breakup to try to look at the situation logically instead of maybe telling us a false story based on what our emotions are telling us? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a little bit off of what we just talked about. I mean, I think the reason that sometimes we get so hung up on people, even if we've decided, oh, that person was not right for me. You know, the person who was right for me wouldn't have done that. Or the person who was right for me, we, we would have found an amicable middle ground. I, even in the face of that, we're still a little illogical where we'll just, we'll just go nuts. So I think the key is proving to yourself that love is a big part of life, but it's not the only part of life. And that's an important distinction so that we don't put so much weight on that right now. And I think the practical answer is getting out there and experiencing life and friendship and hobbies and passions and music and food and exercise and all these things that can show you that there's more to life than love. And because there truly is, there's love of yourself, there's platonic love, there's love of passion, there's love of art, there's love of music, there's love of food, there's love of travel, there's all these things that I think if you could just get out there and splash all that on your face, you can realize that, yeah, I still want love, but for now, I'm going to prove to myself that it's not the only thing in my life. So, you know, the easy answer that I'm sure the internet can get around is go out there, hang out with friends, go out, do some fun stuff, get away from obsessing over partnership and that person and love and assuming extremes like you'll never love again or all men or all women or this to where we're just talking about. Prove to yourself that love's an important part of your life, but it's not the only part. And you can come back to that in a little bit. Should we listen to our friends and family what to what they say after a breakup? Because a lot of the times what they tell you is you did nothing wrong. Don't worry about it. It's their fault. Everything's their fault. Um, you're amazing how you are. You're perfect. How much should we listen to our families and friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, the tricky one. I mean, I think we should listen for sure. And you never know when they might say something that triggers some truth in you. But for the most part, you, you know, your friends are there um, to, to tell you what you want to hear. The best friends, though, are there to maybe not tell you what you want to hear. And those are the ones you want to listen to. The ones that say, hey, you are beautiful and hot and you're a catch and all that. But you do realize that, you know, you played a large role in that relationship, right? You do realize that you put up with a lot. You do realize that you said one thing and did another. Those are the people you do want to listen to because they're, they're going to get you straight so they actually change your behavior. So I think the answer is somewhere in between. Um, you know, don't listen to the people who just echo what you say or what you want to hear. Listen to the people who give you tough love because they love you and because they want you to do better and they want you to honor your best self and what you actually deserve. So if you're lucky enough to have those people in your life, go go talk to the people who aren't afraid to, to hurt your feelings a little bit for, for you know, the betterment of, of your larger self. Yeah, a mindset that I find helpful is a lot of the times after a breakup or after rejection, we feel like there's something wrong with us. And a, a way I like to reframe it is there's nothing wrong with you, but maybe there was something wrong with what you did. Maybe you did something that was a little wrong. What's your thoughts on that statement? I love that. I think that's great. Actually, yeah, I, I wrote a, I created a guided journal like a year ago called Closure. And it was all about finding closure and creating closure for yourself. And the, the first chapter was not being afraid to sit down and say, I was wrong. I think that's the most empowering thing in life, your ability to admit you're wrong because then we're in a, in a headspace to be right. But if you're clinging to this desperate brand of, I wasn't wrong, they were wrong, they wronged me, I'm the victim, we're really primed to not make better decisions in the future. We're still, we're still primed for that wrongness instead of reprogrammed to allow ourselves to humble ourselves, check the ego, and go out and get right. So I love that, I think that's fantastic, and I think that is in a sign of emotional maturity. And emotional maturity is power. It's absolute power. That's restraint in the face of the easy answer, which is always, they were wrong, I'm the victim. Um, it's not easy, but I think it's the most powerful thing you could do for yourself. So very much agree with you. Yeah, I feel like people, um, by having this existential crisis of there's something wrong with me, you're kind of robbing yourself of actually seeing how you can make changes and what adjustments you need to make. A lot of times we kind of just come to the conclusion that I suck or this person sucks without actually looking into, oh, what do I have to do differently next time in order to see different results? Um, so the next thing I want to um, shift to is 
How do we stomach, this is kind of related to breakups. How do we stomach when we see someone that we used to date dating someone else? That, that's a really hard thing to go through. How do we stomach that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's going to be painful regardless, right? You'd have mm. to be kind of a checked out emotionless person to, to look at that and be like, ah, oh, cool. Like, I think it's rare, right? I think it's rare to be able to truly be friends with an ex, although I think it's great if you can pull it off. I think it's rare to be able to look at an ex partner in a happy relationship and not feel something like you should feel something. Um, so I think it's tough. I, I think the answer probably lies somewhere in understanding that, you know, it's healthy to look back at relationships and people and be like, oh, we had good times together. We really did. And I appreciate those times. But to end it there and say, I don't need to go back to that to appreciate it. I don't need to dwell on that person in the present to appreciate what we had. I think it comes down to this whole idea of like failed love. Like any love that ends isn't failed love. Like it served a purpose. And, the, and we can go into the cliche of it, it taught you what you want, it taught you what you didn't want or whatever. Or we could just be practical and say the time you spent with that person, let's say you dated for a year, you had some great times together, some great laughs, you went on some great trips together. Those were great moments. Failed love doesn't wipe those off the face of the planet. We could still appreciate those things as great moments. Temporary people play an enormously important role in our lives. And if we're always labeling them as failed or we're continuing to keep our hooks in them and say, I need to go back, then I think we're doing ourselves a disservice. So I think if we can understand that in the context of seeing your ex with someone in the present, we're more equipped to be like, oh, that's things a little because I remember being with her or with him, but I could still appreciate those things without having to go back to them. I could still appreciate those things without being emotionally tied in the present. That is freedom. And I think it starts with like redefining failed love, redefining what it means for a relationship to end. Um, I think it'll help you stomach that much more compassionately. Another, another mindset I, um, that I suggest after a breakup, and I would love to hear your thought on this, is that if you actually cared about them, you would give them what you want, or you would give them what they want. And so I feel like a lot of people after breakups is that they get mad at the other person for leaving them. They get mad at the other person for finding someone else without understanding that if you actually cared about them, you would let them do what they want to do with their life. What are your thoughts about that? Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it takes a very mature person to see that. I think that's, uh, that's the, a mix of awareness and empathy, frankly, that if you're equipped with it, that is a gift to, to be able to, to set someone free in that manner. Um, I think it, it takes a, a lot of restraint, but I think, um, you know, again, I think it comes down to, to saying, you know, I can let this person go because I, you know, I respect them and love them or whatever it may be, but you know, we're just not meant to be. Yeah. I think, again, we put so much emphasis on this idea of like, um, time in a relationship that if we're not together forever, that means everything is messed up. They're horrible. I'm horrible. The whole thing, we start going to these extremes, whereas it could simply be, I'm letting this person go or they're letting me go when the decision has been made. And it can come from a variety of places. It can come from the place that you're referencing. It could come from a place of lack of readiness, lack of eagerness, lack of honesty, whatever. But I think getting to that, that place of not slapping on labels so quick, it'll allow us maybe to be the, the person you're describing. Yeah. I feel like if by not respecting what they ask for or not respecting space, a lot of people, they, they hit them, like they text them over and over again, or they're, they're calling them or they're bugging their friends about them. In my eyes, that's just kind of you being selfish because once again, if you actually cared about this person, you would let them do, do what they want. And if they ask for space and you actually cared about this person, you would give them that space. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, I think that's a very mature way to look at it. And maybe you can compound that with, you know, if someone is asking for space, it's not your job to convince them otherwise. That is their stated desire. And we're not in the mentality of, of chasing in the, in the negative sense, in the energetic sense. So you put those two together, a desire that you say you like this person, you care about this person, and they're saying, I want this thing, we'll give them the thing. And if it doesn't involve you, toughest pill to swallow in the world, but there you are, an aware, mature, empathetic person, let them have it so that you can clear your conscious. I think the best thing to live in life is a clear conscious, right? You're not out there hurting anyone. You're not out there trying to manipulate anyone. You're not labeling anyone. You're not hating anyone. 
what a free way to live your life, man. Uh, that's how I want to live truly. And I think if you could do what you're describing, hit it, hit the nail on the head for sure. How do we be okay with being single? Especially when we look around and we see everyone else appears like they're in a happy relationship. How do we, how do we be okay with being single and how do we make sure that we utilize that time uh, to make our life better in the long term? Cause being single is a very transformative time. Um, as much as being in a relationship. Yeah. I mean, I think being single is amazing. I wrote a book called single is your superpower. Cause I, mm. I believe it's when you make sense of the world. And I think you could certainly make sense of the world with a partner. Absolutely. But it's an evolution. Like to, to empower yourself to be single, we have to do a couple things for one. We've got to ignore the stigma. We got to stop listening to our parents. We got to stop those things for one. Um, for two, we got to realize what is the point of a partner? What is the point of your partner? The point of the partner, and I'll borrow from Rachel Hollis, who was on my podcast, and she said this in passing, but I don't think she realized how impactful it was. She said that, you know, she, she was married for a long time and then divorced. And she said, um, I decided that I want a partner to do life with, not build life with. And I think that distinction is so important because if we think that our role in life is to be born, find a partner, and then build your life together, what does that say for all the in-between time? It means we're doing nothing, which is so far from the truth. The po point of a partner is to do life with. And then a way to do life with is to have a life before your partner, to have a sense of yourself, to know what you want, your passions, your hobbies, to have a worldview, to have happiness, and then to find someone who amplifies it. So really, that's how I look at life and love. The, the role of a partner is to amplify something that you've already created. But if you're sitting there waiting for someone to come along so that you can finally create that thing, I think you're doing yourself a huge injustice. And I also compound that with the fact that um, I used to like to ask this question a lot, ask older generations what you regret in life. And I've heard so many answers from career and love and relationships and, and sense of self and everything. When it comes to answers of what do you regret in life from people in their 60s and 70s and love, I've heard every answer about I regret getting into a relationship too soon, having kids too soon, uh, staying in a toxic relationship, chasing someone who didn't want me wrapping my entire life around a partnership. I've never heard an answer that says, I regret being single. I've never heard it. I've never heard it. So you could take that for what it's worth from older generations looking back, connecting the dots looking back. Uh, I think that's powerful perspective. I don't think you're ever going to regret being single. If you believe in yourself and you believe what you bring to the table and you'll believe that you will find your partner, even if it's not as early as you want, then your single years are are so rewarding, so much more rewarding. They are there for you to get out and create a life that a partner will amplify. And I think that mentality should amp you up to ignore the cliche of, you know, being single means there's something wrong with you or being single means you're falling behind or any of that nonsense and get down to the business of being single, which is to enjoy life. And you just happen to be single, which is the word.